It is so good to be back. You know, all, and I'm sure Sayyidina will agree with me, there are a lot of things we do by necessity and out of responsibility. But, but speaking for myself, the only thing that really keeps me going is the pastoral side of the work. So being able to be here with you over this weekend is, is worth more than anything else I would have done this weekend. So thank you for thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve you and thank you to say it for, for allowing me to do this. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. There's a deep philosophical question that we all ask. What is our life for? And depending on the answer, we will then live our lives. For many of us, life is going to be what it is here and now. We live for the moment, to achieve what we want to achieve now, to gain what we want to gain now, and that's the end of it. That's it. It's a very self-gratifying experience. And, as we've heard over this weekend, it becomes very selfish, very self-centered. And it becomes also self-destructive, because there is nothing regenerating about it. The way God created us is within a scope of regeneration. So, even, and I, I'm, I'm the medics out there, or... or people who know biology much more than me, will know that even our skin cells, they regenerate. They die and they regenerate. They die and regenerate. So with most of other cells in our body. And so we are meant to be replenished, not just to be self-gratifying, self-satisfying, here and now, and that's it. Which means we really need to be aiming for something different, something higher than we have in this world. We need to be looking towards something that is much more pertinent and something much more long-lasting. And we often think this is very complex. Why aren't you trying to follow a spiritual life, a spiritual ethos, to live righteousness is just too complicated. It's just there's too much to think about, too much to do, too many considerations, but actually it's not at all. Maybe I'm just oversimplistic, maybe I'm just simple. But in my mind, the core values and the life are very simple. Sometimes applying them and living it become more complicated. But the values are very simple, and today in particular, we want to look at achieving higher values. And I want to take us back to an element of simplicity. A simple righteousness. A simple desire to live righteously, and to live in a godly way. If we strip everything back to the bone, we realize that the message of Christianity and of our Lord Jesus Christ, the message of God to us, even in our creation, is very simple. It's one of love. God created us because he loves us. He took flesh and came to save us because he loves us. And he waits for us in his kingdom because he loves us. That's all it is. There is nothing else to it. There is an overcomplication there. But a lot of the complication is to do with practice and application rather than the message itself. And so I want to focus on the message. And I think if we focus on the message, then we focus on what the message means to us, then we can live it. First Epistle of St. John, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. That's all it is. So 
to break it down. We need to love one another because love is a godly thing. God has given us love to impart it to each other, to share it with each other. Not to keep it to ourselves, not to use it selfishly, not to be centered. I mean, we need to love ourselves as the image and likeness of God because we can't love others without loving ourselves as God's creation. Otherwise we get lots of other issues that come into the equation. So yes, we love ourselves as God's creation, but as God's creation, as his image and likeness, we also know that if we are like him, and I'll come to this later, then we are selfless like him as well. And our love is focused on others. So St. John is very clear here. Let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God, we all are, but knows God. So, to know God is to know love. That's, that's the litmus test. That's the proper application. How do I know I'm living a godly life? People will say, well, how do I know? Do you love others? Why am I put anger, anger towards this person and resentment towards that person and jealousy over here and covetousness here? Well, where is God in all of that? Where is the simplicity of the message and the sanctity and the righteousness I should be living in? The simplicity of God is that he wants us all to be saved. And he wants us all in the process to be at peace in this world. He wants us to live, be living here happily and then to be in his kingdom happily. Whether it's the ladder of divine ascent, whether it's any other spiritual practice, whether it's our rites, our rituals, our sacraments, don't forget that all of these are a means to an end. And that end is salvation. And even salvation is a means to an end. And that end is just being with God. So actually all of this, if we're looking at this weekend's topic, or we're looking at anything else we do within this context, the end goal is for us to be with God forever. And this is only a practice period. This is only a way of us being with Him. Imagine, we spoke about relationships yesterday, and Sabna gave us an exposition about what it means to be in this relationship. Now, if you think of a relationship of people courting and then an engagement period, what's all that for? It's so they can spend the rest of their lives together. The engagement period should not be labored. It should actually be a loving period of expression, but it's limited because of the nature of the interaction in the relationship. That's how we are here. We want to be with God as much as we can, but we are separated because He's there and we're here. We want to be with Him as much as we can. We want to speak to Him as much as we can, but we're separated because we use a different language at the moment. But the actual end game of all of this is for us to be collectively and personally the earthly bride in union with the heavenly bridegroom. And that union for us personally is our presence in God's kingdom with him. First Epistle of St. Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Therefore I exalt First of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, again, this ties into the simplicity of God's message. God wants salvation for all. So if I want to reach that higher value, that it comes from being godly. 
And it comes from being able to have supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks for all men. Now that's difficult sometimes. Difficult in application. We find it very difficult to do anything for all anyone. We're very selective. We, we, we will like certain people, dislike certain people, accept certain people, reject others, and so on and so forth. But for us to actually put a blanket rule of loving all, praying for all, giving thanks for all, is difficult. Over this last week, we have faced such a difficult time. Difficult because we have seen brothers ruthlessly slaughtered. And there have been a variety of feelings. Pain, confusion, surprise, but sometimes even anger. And I would go so far as sometimes even hatred. It's understandable within our human context. But as God's image and likeness, within the words of Scripture that are inspired by the Holy Spirit and are left to us for our own good, we are told to give supplications, prayers, intercessions, and even thanks for all men. Now, it, it may be very difficult to think about giving thanks for those men who killed our brothers. But we can, in a certain way. They were a vehicle, albeit a painful vehicle, but a vehicle through which these faithful men were able to witness powerfully and visibly. We read on to say for kings and all who are in authority that they may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. So when we pray for these people and we, we remember them, we say we don't like the way they are now. We pray for them, we remember them, but we want them to lead a quiet and peaceful and godly life with reverence. We want their lives transformed. It is our role as Christians in the world to be transformative of ourselves and of the world. That's why we're here. We're here to change the world. That's why our Lord was very clear in John 17, you're not of the world, you're in the world, and you are in the world to change the world. Don't be like it, because if you become like it, what are you going to change? You become part of it. But we are called to be transformative. And that's a very simple message of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be transformative. And then we go on to read... For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. The simplicity of Scripture again. Do you mean that God wants those hooded figures to be saved? Absolutely. Absolutely. They were created, created in God's image and likeness as we were. They have strayed. They have followed different, a different ethos. But of course God wants them to be saved. Of course, of course God wants their salvation. Think of people like St. Moses the Great. Think of other people whose lives were changed completely. Saul, who became St. Paul who became a righteous teacher and defender and paid the ultimate price. That was transformative of him and of the world around him. 
godliness and a life of righteousness is a hidden treasure within us and must be realized within. We can't look for righteousness out there. We can't be pushing for righteousness out there. Righteousness starts within us and then overflows into people around us. So if we're trying to change the world, if we're trying to be transformative, if we're trying to have a very simple message, don't go out there and just impose it on others because it doesn't work that way. Our Lord didn't impose anything on anyone. Our Lord lived. And his life became an example and became a guide for us to follow him. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. That's what we need to realize. We always think of living a godly life as being something we have to give things up for. It's always a sacrifice. I have to give up this, I have to give up that, I have to be in self-control. I have to be self-denying. I, I have to be um, in, in, a sen in, a, in, a, in a sense of self-contentment so I can't use self-gratification in any means by any way at the expense of anyone else. I have to be careful what I say, how I dress, where I go, how I act, how I speak. And we consider all of this as limitation after limitation after limitation. But it's not limitation. In the words of this passage, this is great gain. We're gaining. We're taking steps up this ladder. This isn't just a burden for us. Again, it's a burden if I'm looking down here at this world wanting to live now. Because if I'm just looking at here and now, why on God's earth do I want to be restrained? Why do I want to be in control? Why do I want to be self-denying? Why not just enjoy myself? But it's not about here. It's about preparing to be there. It's about taking those steps up that metaphorical ladder, one at a time. And always having my eye very firmly focused on where I'm going. Don't take the step for the sake of the step. Take the step as a step along a journey. Because if you take the step for the step, once you've done it, it's done. We give ourselves a pat on the back and we stop. And how many times have we done that? We'll set ourselves a goal, we'll reach the goal, and that's it. But what about the next step? No, next step, I've done it. I've reached this goal, and that's it. And you realize that that goal actually is only meant as a step to lead to another one. Now, it sounds arduous, it sounds difficult, it sounds like you're constantly journeying and struggling. But enjoy the journey. Enjoy the holiness. Believe it or not, believe it or not, and I'm sorry if this shocks you, holiness is a nice thing. It is a good thing, really. It's not just a drain, it's not just a drag, it's not just a, a, a cramping of your style. <laughs> Holiness is not just something that makes you lose your persona and lose your, 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 your vibe in life. Holiness is something that unlocks you and releases you from the bonds and captivity of sin and the burdens of sin. It's liberating. It's not, it's not encompassing and imprisoning, it's liberating. And so enjoy that journey of liberation. Each step of it, but look at what's coming ahead. And look at the fact that the ultimate joy is what we're seeking. And godliness isn't just for now, it's always. And again we go back to 1 Timothy 4. Eight. Godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of a life that now is 
and of that which is to come. We often don't realize that this holiness is going to give us a good life today. We focus on the struggle today. We don't realize that there are good things to be achieved. I want you to imagine being encased by a certain sin, by a certain addiction, by something that has controlled your life. And if you've experienced any of that, there's never anything very major, whatever, however small it is. And I remember the day that you were able to completely release yourself from that thing and how liberating it was. Remember how it felt, and I have one experience I will never ever forget. It was my first real confession. I was probably 15, 16, and the confessions up to then were just, you know, childish confessions. I don't know, I pinched my sister, pulled her hair, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> She probably remembers still today, I don't. But my first, why do you think that's such a strange thing? I didn't always look like this. <laughs> we had, um, my sister actually visited our center once and she turned up and uh, three of our young guys were there by chance and stepped out of the car and said, this is my sister. And I thought, oh, it's my sister, is it? And I said, no, no, this is actually my sister. And they, they looked square directly at her and thought, he has a sister. <laughs> Believe it or not, I, didn't, I wasn't born like this. <laughs> we, don't, we don't hatch looking like this. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the topic. <laughs> so I remember that one that, that first confession, we were at a, our first ever servants, servants conference. You guys have got it so good. This is way back in the dark ages, when we never had a servants conference before. It was our first ever servants conference in Sydney. And I remember we went and had this servants conference, and I went and had this first full confession. And I came out, I felt like I was gliding. I really felt like that just, things were gone. And I tried to hold on to that feeling for as long as I could. Now imagine that feeling every day. That is the liberation of, of righteousness. That's the liberation of sanctification. Liberation of holiness. And that is available to us every day. So it's profitable for all things because it gives us promise of a life now, a good life now, but also the life which is to come. So Augustine said this, we can never love others truly unless we love the Lord. Each one who loves his neighbor as himself loves God. But he who does not love God then can never even love himself. And so it becomes a, a, vicious, a vicious cycle. If I don't really have love for God, so I can't love myself and I can't love my neighbor. And that leads me into a greater cycle and then spiral of sin. But if I want to come out of that, the simplicity is I need to go back to my first love. In every sense of the word. I need to go back to him. Just a weekend like this where you've intentionally and knowingly left the world behind you and come here to share this weekend in fellowship. To share it around God's Word. Now we have our own social fellowship, which is great, because God wants us to rejoice in this life. But we revolve around the Word of God, around righteousness, around worship, around liturgy, around prayer, around thanksgiving, around God. And don't wait for retreats, because you can never have that many retreats. But have your own retreats. Retreat into yourself, into your own inner wilderness. I know it sounds like top of the mountain kind of reflection, meditation stuff, 
But actually, that's a big part of our monastic life. It is, it is finding that peace and that wilderness within in which you can relate to God. I think I've told you this before, but I remember the day I was supposed to leave the monastery. went to the abbot of the monastery and said, how, how do I do this? How do I live like this? And, and he, in his own very gentle way, he said, what's important is not the monk living in the monastery, but the monastery living in the monk. And each one of us has that wilderness within us that we can encaps encapsulate and we can find. And it becomes that space in which we can reach God. But we need quiet and calm and solitude for it. And that's why Lent, fasting generally, spiritual practice, that all gives us to a greater understanding of what that stillness is and to be with God. So if we give ourselves to that first premise of the simplicity of God's message, which is love, where does that lead us? True love leads us to true selflessness and humility. Automatically. Once we love completely, then we love completely. We become selfless. And in selflessness, we become humble. We put ourselves aside. And this is most evident in this process we're talking about now, being more like God, most evident in the saving act of the Incarnation. That simplicity of, of the message of love led to the ultimate sacrifice and humility of the Incarnation. God taking flesh. Putting himself aside. 1 John 4, 9-10 in this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to us. Right? So this is what we're supposed to be aiming for. We're supposed to be aiming for that first higher value of love. But again, it is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. What is that end? Salvation. So once we love, we become selfless. We put ourselves aside and we think of others. God thought of his whole humanity, his creation, us. And in that lesson, we should follow. So, humility stems from godliness. So, John Chrysostom says, conceit does not stem from knowledge, but from ignorance. He who knows the teaching of godliness tends to become increasingly humble. So the more you know about godliness, even know about it, not even live it, the more you know about godliness, the more humble you become. Because you understand what it means to be godly. So he who knows the teachings of godliness tends to become increasingly humble. He who knows the upright words cannot be ungodly. That's important. That's why scripture is so important for us. That's why in the fast we focus on prayer, fasting, and scripture. We need to be fed. When we know the precepts and premises and teachings of love, we become humble. And we become more like God. He who knows things that are not necessary lacks knowledge. I want you to think. If you were going to go through your mind 
and do a system cleanup like you do on your computer. Right? You're going to defragment your hard drive. You're going to go through your desktop and your hard drive, and you're going to throw away all of that rubbish. You guys call it garbage here, by the way. I'm just translating for you. All of that stuff, you're going to throw it away. The unnecessary things, the things you've accumulated over years, the things you've gathered, the things that are cluttered, the gathering dust, you haven't used them. We become not only hoarders of things, we become hoarders of, of information, hoarders of experience. Imagine if you went through and you cleansed all of that out. How much would you release of yourself? And that's why we go back to St. John Chrysostom's words here. He who knows things that are not necessary lacks knowledge. Because just having information does not make you knowledgeable. To have true knowledge in God is to have a true experience of God. That sounds tweetable. Don't remind me about that one. But honestly, it is. <laughs> it's already gone up. <laughs> and that's, that's the whole point. That's the whole point. The whole point is to really know him, we need to know him. And to experience him, we need to experience him. All this ladder stuff is great. But if it stops at the ladder, if you go away and look at this wonderfully constructed visual aid that is there, and that's where your thinking stops, then we've done nothing. That is just supposed to show you that you are supposed to start from one place and end in another. And that comes from the true knowledge of God and the true love of God that leads us to true humility in God. <coughs> and then St. John goes on to say, and pride arises from ignorance. So perceived knowledge that we get from the world actually end up being, ends up being ignorance of the more important things. And when we have all of that, we end up becoming pride, proud and arrogant. But as I said, the incarnate word, God in flesh, has shown us the true path of godliness and humility together. We often find it difficult to marry position and humility. So if you're the boss, do you, do, you live, do you live humbly with your people around you? The more prominent you become, the more well-known you become, the more of a celebrity you become, does that clash with humility? Or is your status your popularity, your fame, your knowledge, your experience, your intelligence are those things that God has given you and so therefore are only full when joined with humility in Him. Because if they're not joined with humility, they become arrogance of the world. If we have these gifts that God has given us, whether it's the way you communicate, or, or the way you do your work, or the way you think, or the way you do anything. God has given you this talent. If you don't marry that with knowledge that God has given it to you, then it becomes arrogance. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to too justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. That's what we're required to do. And if you look at the incarnate word, our Lord Jesus Christ, during his life on earth, that's exactly what he did. He spoke of justice. He advocated for justice. He is the advocate not only for those around him in the world, he was the advocate for the whole of humanity. So he spoke of justice and he advocated for justice. 
He showed mercy. Mercy to the sinners, mercy to the weak, mercy to the lepers, mercy to the adulterous, mercy to the tax collector, mercy to all around him. Mercy even to those who denied him, and mercy to those who crucified him. Calling that they be forgiven. And walk humbly. And he walked humbly. Literally walked humbly. We often think, oh, how wonderful God is, because from his kingdom he left all of that majesty, all of that sovereignty, and he was born in a manger, and then grew up the son of a carpenter, and then attached himself to fishermen. I assure you that if God had been born into the greatest of families, and lived as the greatest of emperors, and surrounded himself with the greatest of people, it still would have been infinitely humbling because it doesn't compare to the majesty of his kingdom. But in doing what he did, he showed us what was needed to walk humbly. That humility is important. To, to, to put away our dependence on things, our dependence on status, to put away our reliance on money and riches. To be humble in that if we have them, we have them. And if we don't, we don't. We work faithfully to achieve faithfully. But we don't work to achieve what is worldly at the expense of our faithfulness to ourselves. And that's the important thing. Because we've seen this example of humility, it's our blessing, it's our honor to be called His. That's our greatest honor. We take pride in so many other things. But this is what we should take pride in most. That, that sense of holiness that comes from Him and him alone, that our Lord demonstrated personally to me and to you and to the whole world. Colossians 3.12 Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Put all of those on. What does it mean to put them on? It means to, to, to clad yourself with them. It means to cover yourself with them. They become part of you. When you put something on, you don't leave it behind. It's on you. You carry it with you. You journey with it. You live with it. You experience with it. People see it on you. People see its effects on you. He was humble even to death. Philippians 2, 7 and 8. Speaking of our Lord saying, He made Himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient to the point of death. How much more humility is there? How much more humble? Imagine our Lord. He was ridiculed. It's fine. You can put up with that. But then, on Thursday, he celebrates the Passover with his disciples. And they come and take him like a common criminal. Surely then, he would have said, actually, no, this is where it stops. But he let himself be taken captive. And then he is tried in front of various groups. 
At this point, he could have done anything he wanted. Yet he let himself go through it. And then he was taken to Pilate and asked to give account. And he stood silent. Then he was taken and scorched. And he accepted it. Then he was beaten, ridiculed, crowned with thorns, mocked, made to carry his cross, fallen, journeying. Okay, surely this would be enough. Got to Golgotha. Nailed, raised, surely now. Ridiculed and mocked, even by a common criminal beside him. That must be too much. And yet all he did was Father forgive them. That was humility. Now if we take that and apply it, even in the smallest of ways in our own life, how much are we willing to be pushed? How much are we willing to take? How much are we willing to put aside ourselves and our honor? How humbly are we willing to live? Surely, if we're living the simplicity of the message of love, that leads automatically to the humbling life that we live. Because in humility we gain one thing. 1 Peter 5, 6 Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. We humble ourselves because we walk in the footsteps of our Lord. But we humble ourselves because of that greater thing we want to achieve. That righteousness we want to live and that kingdom we want to enter. Now, these don't come haphazardly. Neither the life of love nor the life of humility. They have to be intentional. There has to be an understanding of what we're doing. And there has to be a seeking of wisdom. A discernment of what God wants for us and of us. And how he wants to lead us. What does he want from us? We often ask ourselves, what does God want in my life? Well, simple. This is the will of God, your sanctification. And again, sanctification is good in itself, in this life, but it is just to ensure that we're going to live with him in his kingdom. First John 4, 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That's where discernment comes in. God, how do you want me to live? I want you to love each other. I want you to know this is my will. I want you to be like me and to conduct yourself like me. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Be like me. That's what God says to us. Be like me. Not because I want to change you for my own purposes, but because that is how you are best. That is your optimal state. Because I created you like me and my image and likeness. And so therefore for you to reach that sense of holiness and righteousness, be like me again. Fight against all of these worldly notions of anger and resentment and hatred. Yes, absolutely. Bless those who curse you. Bless them. It's hard enough not cursing them back. No, bless them. Be a blessing for them. Let them see you. Do good to those who hate you. Really? I don't want to even deal with them. No, do good to those who hate you. 
because it is that good that will break the hatred. Pray for those who spitefully persecute you. No, no, I'll pray for the victims, but never for the ones who persecute us. But that's not true either. Our Lord says, I prayed for those who persecuted and crucified me while I was on the cross. I'm not asking anything of you that I haven't done in front of you. That is my discernment for your life. That's my wisdom for you. That's my desire for you. I want you to become more like me so that in becoming more like me, you can become more prepared for my kingdom. I'm shaping you. I'm molding you. I'm preparing you. James 1.27 Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, that you visit the orphans and widows in their trouble and keep yourself unspotted from the world. If we really want discernment and guidance and a sense of where to go, this is it. Do good works and keep yourself righteous. Following on from this example, we realize that we need to live humbly to achieve all of that. Hebrews 12, 2-5 reads, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Are we humble enough to endure hostility from sinners? Or do we go a while back? How, who are you to speak to me like that? Who endured hostility from sinners against himself. Are you ready to endure for that life of righteousness to become better? Or do we just say things? Don't forget that in fasting, there is a sense of not only self-control and restraint, but self-denial. And that's important. It's important to deny our own needs sometimes, our own satisfaction sometimes. That sounds like some crazy masochistic thing we're on, but it's not. It's not. It's a matter that I have a carnal life I live, and there is a spiritual element to my life. And I need to be able to control myself, to have that ability to be more godly and more sanctified. If we're living according to his will, it will become evident to everyone. And we've seen this just this week. It will become evident to everyone. Not only in those who so honorably and courageously face their death, but in their families. One of the brothers said, well, actually, no, I'm, I'm happy for him. He's in a better place. He's a martyr. He's a saint. I'm proud of him. I'm proud to be associated with him. Who knows the family of a victim who would ever say that? Or those who have said, no, forgiveness is, is what we do. We must forgive. It's what we do as Christians. It's how we live as Christians. It's the message we've been given. It's not just theory, not just hypothesis. This is what we do and how we live. Gospel of St. John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's what we need in our lives. Lord, how do you want me to live my life? I want you to live in love, so you can be humble, and I will show you by being more like me. It is only when you are more like me, when you have my spirit, you have 
the life that I live, that you're able to understand what I want. You see, in opening ourselves up this way, we understand the mind of God better because we engage with Him more closely and we understand Him more precisely. You know when you want to get to know someone, you have to, and the expression is, get into their head. But you've got to think like them. Now, if we think like God, then we'll know what God wants of us. But we often live out here totally distant from God. Totally distant from anything he stands for. Totally distant from anything he wants of us. And we want to know him, but how? When we're so isolated. I want to close with another saying from St. John Chrysostom. You have to be an example of goodness in every way and a model of Christian living. This will be a living testimony, a basis, and a yardstick to others seeking to lead a godly life. That's how God wants us to live, for ourselves and for others. We need to be like Him, with Him, in Him, but also to be transformative in this world through the love that we live for Him, knowing the love that He gives us, the humility that we live in Him, knowing how humble He was to come and save us, and being guided by Him, that we may be His light and His example and His transformative power in the world for ourselves and for all those around us that we, and as many around us as possible, may reach his kingdom, because this is his ultimate desire for us. Glory be to God for that. Just take a moment to reflect on that, please. stretch on you. When you were describing us being when you, the mic, please. when you were describing us being hoarders of experience um, and how that could just turn into perceived knowledge of the world and you you asked us to kind of clean ourselves out like defragmenting a hard drive computer or hard drive from computers. What are we are we supposed to keep anything from our experiences? Like You'll, you'll be surprised how much we keep anyway. Yeah. I mean, we go through experiences, and, and that's part of counseling sometimes, where you'll know something's wrong, but it's only when you really dig that you understand how much you've actually carried with you. So it, it, it is important. It's, it's important for us to look at what we've accumulated, and some of it will be good. There, we have very good experiences in our lives. But what I meant is, you know, the, the, state, the quote then was, was the more we accumulate things that aren't worthwhile, the more ignorant we become. Because we're just bogged down in useless, senseless information and experience. That at best is useless and senseless, at worst is actually destructive. And I think that's what we need to, to be able to get with. So we need to take like fine tubes, um, and Absolutely, and that's the, that's the period of fasting. It's self-reflection. It's it's a sense of, of going through our lives and critically assessing who we are and where we are and where we're going, and fixing that. And if we get used to doing it on a regular basis, it won't take so long. Absolutely, it, it has to be has to be incremental. You know, your, your first spring cleaning will be really bad, <laughs> but then if you're anything like me, once you've done a really good clean. You keep it clean for as long as you can, until it starts to slide again. Then, but and then that's, that's the understanding of continuous confession, continuous repentance, where you're just you're constantly fine tuning, rather than having to do a whole clean up every time. Yes. Sayyidna, so, how do you know you've truly forgiven someone? Like you've had an experience, and how do you? Um, I mean, you've confessed it, you've prayed about it. You've gone the extra mile. You don't have any bitterment or resentment, but 
you don't want to be in fellowship again. But there are two different things. I mean, as you've seen over this last week, I said I, f I fully forgive those who perpetrated these, these horrible crimes. It doesn't mean I want to be in fellowship with them. It doesn't mean I want to deal with them. But I forgive them. I love them. But that I don't need to be because light and darkness cannot coexist. So... To be at peace with someone and to forgive someone doesn't mean you need to go back and deal with someone because some dealings are destructive. Now, the, dis the, the distinction is going to come on whether I don't want to deal because of my ego or I don't want to deal because of my wanting to maintain my sense of holiness. And so therefore, they don't coexist. Say, you know, when you say you forgive them, what do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> it means I, I'm not angry, I'm not resentful, I'm not hateful. It means I know that what people are doing is out of a sense of broken humanity. And we all suffer from brokenness in humanity. And I know that there is always space for repentance and transformation. And otherwise, our faith in God is not what it should be. So, in that case, I do forgive because I've committed my sins in my own way. I haven't done anything like this. But I'm just as sinful in my own way, at my own level. And so therefore, if I want to be forgiven, my humanity and my brokenness, then I, then I forgive others. And it's not just because I want to be forgiven, it's because I actually understand the vulnerability of a broken humanity. And that could happen to anyone. If we let our hearts be defiled by anything, we don't know what we're capable of. Once the sanctity and the sacredness of, of life has been taken away from us and we lead ourselves away from God it's frightening what we can become you, know yeah. uh, you said in the beginning that we are here to change the world um, and you said that we have to feel righteousness first from the inside to overflow um, what are the limits that I have to put to myself when I'm saying changing the world? Like, do I talk when it's, when it's allowed for me to talk about something that is against the will of God that's going on around me? Or um, do I just pray and love, like you said? Um, and how, how do I not look to people down when I'm changing the world? To want to change the world, I've got to, be, and that's a very good question because I've got to be very careful that I'm not being condescending about it. Not saying, I love you and I hope you change because you're evil, but it's alright, I know that you're sinful. That's, that's not being godly, that's not being gracious. When God looks at us and forgives us, He loves us. And He forgives us because He loves us. So, we do run a risk as Christians of sometimes becoming self-righteous because we think we've, we've got it, we're fine, we're, we'll, we'll help these poor, poor people who just don't know any better. And that becomes our attitude. Um, to your question, I think it's going to be very different in, in different situations. In some situations, I have to speak very publicly. In some situations, I'll speak privately. In some situations, it'll be a gesture. In some situations, it'll be a, an action. It's very different for different people in different situations. And what you'll find is that situation will change with your life as you go on. It won't be just one kind of witness. You'll have different kinds of witness depending on where you are in life and what you're doing and what, what is open to you. Last one, yes. So, you know, when you're talking about, you know, the brain cleaning and doing all this um, self-reflection, um, 
with, you know, we're all fairly young and we have jobs and all that, and, and I don't, <laughs> fairly young, yeah. Um, as far as when, you know, eventually we'll, we're going to have families and all of that. So is doing all this just a matter of appropriate time management or do we, is there another trick to doing this? Because we, you know, most of us have very demanding jobs and home life might not be there, but when it is there, then how do we do all of that? First of all, I'm fairly young, so you must be very young. <laughs> 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 um, I think it's both. I think it is management, life management. It's a taking control of our lives rather than lives taking control of us. Um, and it's a, purpose, uh, it's a purposefulness of life. We sometimes let life drag us around. Whereas we need to be purposeful about what we do. We need to know where we want to go, what we want to achieve. And we don't want to be control freaks over our lives, but we need to have an element of ownership and an element of understanding of where we want to be. And of course, then it takes discipline, it takes experience. And as you transition from one stage to the next, you know, I think about it as you're flying, just as one, one hint, I don't know if you know this, you can always tell when you're transitioning from flying over the sea to flying over land, and vice versa. There's always an element of turbulence. That's because the pressures are very different going over water and going over, over land. And so any transition in life is going to create a bit of turbulence. Whether it's high school to university, university to work, work to family life, family life to marriage, marriage to kids, kids to, you know, whatever, there's going to be a bit of turbulence every time. And it's a matter of facing that turbulence with calmness, with composure, but still with purposefulness, and saying, okay, I've got to deal with this. Now my life has changed, my time has changed, my, the requirements, what I'm, what's asked of me has changed. Now rather than throwing everything out, how do I make this work? And it, it'll take a, a slight redefinition and reordering, but as long as I know what I'm wanting to do, then I can do it. Okay? One. Go back to your original love. Thank you. Two. Take a step for the journey. Three. So right down the back. Change the world from within first. Four. Someone here. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Holiness doesn't cramp your style. Sorry? Holiness doesn't just cramp your style. Holiness does not cramp your style. Now, ladies, you've been very quiet, so I'm going to take five from you as well. One. <laughs> Sorry? Do spring cleaning. That is so stereotypical. <laughs> and then you blame us. And then you comment like that. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Be transformative. Thank you. Three. Following the example of our Lord. Following the example of our Lord. Four. back here. Following is liberating. Five. True love leads us to selflessness and humility. True love, sir, leads us to selflessness and humility. And glory be to God for that. Amen.